Support for We Don't Say Goodbye has been provided by the Robertson Museum and Science Center, Binghamton, the Sheldon H. Solo Foundation, the Shore family, and the family of Dr. Edmund Goldenberg. We heard Hitler's voice over the radio, but we didn't know that he would do away with the Jews. They put on, a, on those cattle cars, probably a hundred per car, with barely room to stand. I'm sure my mothers know that we are going. That is no good because she talked to us on the way to the cattle car. And later on in the cattle car that you must survive, I won't survive, but you must survive to tell your story. Here we are, thousands of miles from Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Treblinka, and more than a half century removed from the end of the Second World War and the evils of the Nazi state. Six million Jews and others perished in the Holocaust. Those who survived were displaced to many parts of the world. These are the memories of the Holocaust survivors who came to America and happened to settle within 40 miles of each other in upstate New York. They might not all have been personally acquainted or knew each other's stories, but their experiences fit together. Down the middle of the street, of course, the Nazis marching with their big flags and their boots, and of course also their bands, and kids standing on the side of the, watching them, sometimes giving the Heil Hitler sign. Of course, uh, as a kid, I did it too, much to my chagrin now. I wouldn't say that it's behind you. Something, I guess, will remain with you for the rest of your life. You do remember what happened to you, that you didn't have a normal upbringing, like, for instance, Fern went, my wife Fern went to a class reunion. I had no class reunion because I went to school in Germany, Switzerland, France, and here. My earliest memories had merely had much to do with my family. I remember going to school in Berlin. These were actually happy memories. In overall, I can say that we, have, we had a happy childhood. There was no anti-Semitism in Holland before the war. We went to school. We were still young. I remember that we were warned by somebody who would knock at our window door in the school to tell the Jewish children that it was time for the Jewish children to go home because they had to go home before Shabbat starts. We used to walk out to, to the shul together. That was, and when we came from shul, that was the nicest thing, but I ever remember that. Special Friday night to make Kiddush. With, uh, nine candles. My mother used to light nine candles. I have wonderful memories from that time in my childhood. All that changed in 1933. The friends that I had, both little boys and little girlfriends, were uh, mixed Jewish and Gentile. But in 1933, um, the Gentile boys uh, didn't want to play with me anymore. In middle school, I was tolerated. It was much worse during, during the medical school. <clears throat> they didn't, at that time, they did not want to have any Jews. They uh, allowed only uh, a limited amount of Jews. 
Of all the Southern Tier people who survived the Holocaust, none was as dedicated to teaching about that period of history as Dr. Edmund Goldenberg. He sponsored educational projects in the Broome County Schools and wrote a book about persecution he faced as a young physician just out of medical school. I got in, I was fortunate enough, but they even didn't want us, let us sit with everybody else. We had special seats assigned to the Jews and outside. In the classes were anatomy that we were, we were expected to provide our own corpses for, for the section, uh, and so on. Like the professors and the teachers who were dismissed from the universities had no income either and emigrated very quickly. My father did not fall into that category and being a um, veteran of the First World War always thought this cannot last very long, we will survive it, etc., etc. So I think what happened is they did not have the insight at the time that you had to leave. How could have they predicted what was going to happen? And Nazis being 2% in 1928, how could they predict what that political program was going to, to, to look like? Dr. Lance Sussman is a rabbi and a historian. From 1989 to 2001, he was spiritual leader of Temple Concord, the Reformed Jewish Congregation in Binghamton, and associate professor of history at Binghamton University. Among his writings is the book In Our Midst about how the Holocaust influenced this one American community. I would say it takes a long time for one's psyche and for the collective public's psyche to be reorganized uh, in a way where you could make the kind of statement that ultimately uh, Leo Beck made that a thousand years of German Jewish life was over. Mm. Who could imagine? Their families had been there for a thousand years. When I fought back and when other people fought back, uh, they backed off. They were taken by surprise because Jews were known in Poland and in Germany for not fighting back. That just was unbecoming to Jewish people, or we were afraid, or whatever it was. We didn't know what to do, whether we could be evicted, being Jewish, and so on. It became, life became absolutely hell. It finally ended that we have to eat in a Jewish soup kitchen, which was really the bottom of the barrel. I'll never forget that. And, uh, then came the Kristallnacht in 1938. November 9th and 10th, 1938, the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht. Organized attacks on Jews and their property across Germany. In Berlin, Leopold Grunfeld was an eyewitness. The streets seemed empty because people were congregating to the places where the action was to the synagogues and to the stores. I went to the synagogue first, and it was in flames. Pressure on the Jewish community had been mounting, maybe with the exception of events just before the 36 Olympics when the Nazis were trying to put a little better face on uh, for the outside community, and in fact used Kristallnacht to get the anti-Semitism going again. It was compensatory. They'd maybe let it go too far from their, their very distorted perspective. Uh, I think it was the scale and the ferocity that caught people by surprise. I saw uh, Torah scrolls unrolled in the streets and people walking on them. I don't know what got into me. I had a friend who went with me to the Herzschule. was a little bit older than I am and he's told me that we should go inside and rescue one of those Torah scrolls and uh, we did. In retrospect I think it was probably one of the more foolish things that I have done. That day had the largest impact on my life, although the day itself, the day itself, as I remember, it didn't really traumatize me. I mean, I didn't get hysterical. 
I was curious, and I was driven by curiosity, not by, not by fear. I didn't really think that anything was going to happen to me. One day, we had to pack, just leave the house, bring the thing, and they put up a ghetto wall. So we were in a ghetto. Even though her father was Jewish, Berlin native Lilo Ries was able to escape persecution. But as a young woman, she remained a witness to the evils of the Nazi regime and the destruction of wartime. Everybody was afraid to go there. This is, I think, the shock they wanted to do, to make people be afraid. We tried to live a normal life in the beginning. We had services, we made uh, temporary synagogues, and I remember, you know, no matter what, how bad the condition is, somehow you try to survive. Laws went on in severity and in small steps. And I remember each time something came out, like, um, for example, Jews cannot uh, leave in the evening unless they get special permission. But if you did, I, I got special permission to go to school. But each time one of these things came out, we would say to each other, oh, that's no big deal, we can live with this. And then the next thing would come. As things got worse, Jews and other opponents of the Nazi regime did seek a way out. Ruth Windmuller and her family were passengers on a well-known journey of dashed hope. My father found out that he could get a visa in Berlin. How he found out, I don't know. They went to Berlin and they bought a visa for my father, my mother, and myself to go to Cuba on the San Loy. It was very luxurious. We were in 7-7 on the St. Louis. Once we got on and moved out of the harbor, we were free. When we arrived in Havana, we got ready to get off that morning, but things didn't move. People say that the Hapak America line knew that we could not land because we had paid not only passage to Cuba, but they also asked us to pay for return passage. To Cuba, we paid first class, return, it was all tourist class. After about a week, uh, we had to leave Havana Harbor, and we headed towards the United States. We didn't know it, but we were heading towards Miami, and we could see the city in the distance, but uh, there was no way they would let us land. Ruth and many of the children spent the war years in orphanages. Many of the passengers aboard the St. Louis survived, but some did perish in the concentration camps. Meanwhile, Leopold Grunfeld's family fled Berlin and joined some 17,000 Jews in Shanghai, China. The heat was unbearable. The humidity was as high as the temperature, because Shanghai is actually at sea level. It turns out, I say this now, it turns out this is the best thing that ever happened to us. But again, you have to understand that we came, you know, dressed in the uniform of Central European Jews, you know, who came to, to I don't know what we expected there. There was an enormous amount of sickness that comes in tropical countries with, uh, with poverty and very, very kind people. The Chinese were enormously kind. People were being displaced as soon as the Nazis come into power, and, and Binghamton and, and environs in particular you begin to get uh, German Jews coming in who will become involved in uh, dairy production, dairy farming. Others will work for a photographic company, depending on their uh, technical skills. So you, you get people coming in. Uh, throughout the 30s prior to mass killings. This uncle of my mother's was a career army officer and a physician. He protected himself because when people could, uh, came knocking at the door, and this was something that particularly the Hungarian Arrow Cross Party, the Hungarian Nazi Party did a lot, they would knock at doors and say, is there a Jew here? Does a Jew live here? 
hard knocks, he had to open the door. He would uh, be in his um, high officer's uniform with the medals and open the door. And he would, uh, he then told me rather chucklingly, laughingly, that they would jump to attention, salute, and leave. September 1st, 1939, the Germans invi invaded Poland very, very easily. Soon the swastika would fly all across Europe. That night, I will never forget. Because when the radio had announced that um, Holland was no more, we all sat together in the living room. And my mother had settled herself in her chair, uh, staring into space, and she was ashen gray. But uh, nothing happened. And that first night in Holland, uh, many Dutch families committed suicide. John Sternberg's family emigrated legally from Germany to France. They held together even through time in a French concentration camp. But then his parents had to go into hiding. I remember the four of us with two guides walking through woods towards the Swiss border and we hid above a road, a railroad, barbed wire, and then Switzerland. Um, now these guys knew of a certain place that there was no barbed wire. So at one point it, they told us to go ahead now, the patrols have gone by, cross the road, the railroad, go into Switzerland. Now my father had been in the First World War and he was afraid that when you walk at night, you have a tendency to walk in circles. So we walked and walked. It, I don't know, it was maybe 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I don't know, I don't remember. And we came to a small village. And I remember a man, it was maybe 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock at that time, and a man on a bicycle came along. First question. And I spoke perfect French, I told you. Uh, sir, can you tell me, are we in Switzerland or are we in France, you know, from walking? He says, you are on the outskirts of Geneva. He says, I want you to come with me. With the uh, permission of the parents, they placed children into foster homes. And I was fortunate enough to end up with a doctor in Basel, Switzerland, who had four children of his own. And he took me in as a fifth child, and I was with them for four years. One day, you, you they congregate you in that marketplace, on that open space, and they were sending away people to different concentration camps. And one day, my brother, my youngest brother, who was 13, he was sent away to Treblinka, where we never saw him again. We didn't know about that at that time, where he's going. Everybody from that time on had to carry a little ID card in their pocket at all times. Then, then there was a special registration for Jews only. And we had to come to the city hall, and our ID was, was stamped with a big J. Once the Nazis were in power, they did conduct a racial census. And the fact of the matter is that the technology at that point, which supported census taking, was an IBM-based technology. Now, it was not IBM Endicott. There was a German uh, parallel uh, division. But nevertheless, that was the technology that was employed by the Nazi government to do racial classification. You didn't have to go around in town and say, this one's Jewish, this one's Jewish. It was already done on an on a, um, organized, systemic, uh, systematic fashion. I mean, that, and that is one of the most important aspects of, the, of understanding the, the Holocaust. This was not random. This is, it is different than a massacre. You have a, a nation state using the systems of a national 
government toward a particularly nefarious goal, which is the destruction of a people and a, and a, and a culture and, and ultimately a biological destruction of a people. We were always afraid, always scared to sleep through the night. We used to run out through the night because somebody was uh, telling us the Gestapo will come and take us all. That was almost once a week or twice a week we, we did it. They took away the women, the children, and all the people. There were people trying to hide. They were finding them relatively easy, and they were killing them. We, the remainder, remaining men, did not go to the camp right away. The work came right away. There's only one type of work that I knew of, and that was going out still inside the gates and digging graves, that is mass graves. Usually when I went, the graves were already filled or half filled, and they were big white hills of chlorine, which smell terrible. And for years after that, and to this very day, I associate the smell of chlorine with death. And then we came to Auschwitz. What did you see? A lot of dogs, you know, and, and music. They had music playing. And later they took us, they took us to the crematoriums, but I didn't know it's a crematorium. We didn't know what it is, you know. Well, it looked to me like a baker because the outside was sex, but like like from a bakery, flower, sex or flower, you know. And I said to my husband, so my boyfriend still so was next to me, and I said, it's a bakery, they're baking here. He was smarter than I was. He said, no, honey, what they're doing here is they're burning the people here, and that's the ashes from your parents and from your grandparents and all this. And they came and they took my husband away and they started hitting him because he was, you know, next to me. And they took him away and I didn't see him anymore. Few people volunteered to be the camp elders. And they, were, they had a German Jewish fellow who said he was a doctor. He probably was a medical student, I don't know. But anyhow, he became the camp doctor. I reported too, but the commandant says, we don't need two doctors. We won't need any doctors. The women got shaved, shaved up the hair, and got the numbers. Did you get a number? Yep. What is your number? I have to look at it. Can I look? I don't want to remember that. It's uh, seven, no, wait a minute, eight, two, seven, seven, nine. You see the names, or how they didn't use any more the names. And what is your number? A 5136. This was my name. Can you read the number for me? Yeah, 30,159. And then the bottom shows this because I'm a Jew. They took everything away. And after this, I walked around and I looked for my mother. I didn't see my mother. So I went over there. And a lady, she was from Czechoslovakia. She was Jewish. And I said to her, where's my mother? She says, you, how late you are, how stupid you are. Come on, I'll show you where your mother is. See, to the little window, you can see. You see the fire? Over there is your mother. First came out, a black smoke. And after I used to come out the flame, you didn't, can't even cry. You didn't can't say any, any little thing. 
Because if you cry and you say it, what's right there stink. A German and say, come on, when you get killed. Well, in the barrack, he wasn't allowed to pray. It was a rabbi, a girl. She was very young. She had 16 or 15 years old, maybe 17. And there was Yom Kippur night, uh, Kol Nidre night. And she said to us, listen, I know, I don't have a book, but I, have, I know the prayer by heart, prayer Kol Nidre. But you have to be very, very quiet. Nobody should hear us. She started to say the prayer, and then the door opens, the Gestapo. You're not gonna pray, we should lose the war. They took her away, and we never saw her again. That camp was a hell camp. First of all, the place where we were working was a, a place called Hermann, Hermann Gering Worker. It was in a, in a mountain, carved out a mountain. They made V1 and V2 rockets in there. That's why it was in, in a mountain. And we, our work was to help the Germans the Germans were always screaming, do faster, work faster. They were in such a hurry to make those V1s and V2s. They were always screaming, do fast and walk and do it. It was just like a hell. And accidents were very common, naturally. And if you had the bad accident, that was it. You, you got shot. It was not, you were not useful anymore. I still remember the, the young boy. He got shot with the, with the three or four other sick ones. And he was yelling, I'm not dead yet. Shoot again. Unforgettable sentence. Buchenwald was a new story. They took all the clothing off. And we had to go into a room where they took off all the hair, all from the whole body from everything, and from, when he walked out, he had to go into a basin, like a swimming pool, and your body went and burned everything, it probably was a, it's like a dis disinfecting, it burned all your body, and then he got out, and he stood in line, they gave you clothing. In winter in Poland, probably just as, in southern Poland, just as, as yours here, the lots of snow and frost, People did not have anything to put on. So I went to the, to the German, and I said, we need clothes, we need warm clothes. No problem. Indeed, it was. A couple, of days, couple of days later, three days later, we got a big truck load full of clothes. They dumped it right in the middle of the camp, and then we started looking at it and looking at the seams and some of the messages that were, that were in it. They were came from, that was from Auschwitz. The heartbreaking notes. I love you. Say hello to my mother. Say hello to my wife. I'm worried about my children. It was a big heartbreak to, to survive the close, but we needed them, so we used them. There were some very orthodox Jews in that camp who somehow were allowed to keep their twillers. And, and those are those long prayer uh, songs with a box with all the scripture inside. And they would use those to try to beat other prisoners to get their food. And I know I had this feeling, which vaguely flitted through my head at the time, but I know I had it at the time. This is supposed to be for praying, not for beating. People used to grab the bread from somebody else to eat. I remember once they, they sent six people to bring the soap from the kitchen to our, to our barrack. 
they got hijacked by Russians, and they took away the, the barrel of the soup. The one thing I learned, and it stayed with me also, we didn't say goodbye, we don't say goodbye. We don't say goodbye, you knew that you're not going to see each other anymore. But I had to always hope to see, to see you again. But many people I did not see again, because they, were, they got actually killed. I just know that many people died in the camps, and uh, that it was terrible. Matter of fact, I have pictures. She was Ilse, she was 17 uh, when she went into hiding, and she was 18 or 19 when she was caught. She was sent right to Auschwitz, and uh, this was the end of her. If the Nazi era began with parades, it ended with death marches. As the military situation turned against the Axis powers, inmates of the concentration camps who had not been killed or starved were taken from their barracks and forced to walk themselves to death. They called it the death walk. They walked in without shoes. We had like shoes from wooden shoes. And uh, a lot of people died. A lot of people, in the thousands, special men, they couldn't survive. Special men, they just dropped on the, on the throat. How many, how many people were there? A lot, I don't know, I don't know. They went from, from Hindenburg, from Auschwitz, from, they just got together, thousands and thousands of people. So many, my God. We didn't have any food, we just took some snow from the ground. And you know, we brought a little bread with us. And that's how they survived. The march uh, went to a concentration camp named Mauthausen. And Mauthausen was a large camp near the Austrian-German border, um, which was so large and so full that it formed satellite camps around it. We got to Mauthausen, and I remember that place as large fenced and the chimneys going full blast. I could see the chimneys and the black smoke pouring out of the chimneys. And I knew they were crematoriums. That's where they burned the bodies. Finally we heard the Americans are here. Indeed, I just about was able to crawl out. And there in the gate was standing a couple of American tanks and people were all around him yelling and screaming and dancing and whatever. I didn't go close to it because I was too weak to go in, the, in the, this mass of people. But I saw a small fountain over there. It was not active, but it was some water on the, on the bottom. So I, with difficulty, I crawled over, over there and went down. And I find there was water. Took my water with hands, took it to my face and drank, and drank, and drank. When I had my fill, I looked around. There were two dead bodies floating in the, in the same fountain. I recall that there were no guards there. And for the next two days, there were no guards and there was no food. And it's like opening the cage of a bird. The bird doesn't want to leave the cage, doesn't dare. We were weak and we were afraid. And of course, we knew that it was strictly forbidden to try to leave, that if you could leave, you would be shot. So for two days we stayed there. What drove us out is, is hunger. And we found the doors for not locked, and we got out. And very soon after that, the very same day, I saw American trucks. I saw big green trucks with white stars painted on them. And I thought it was the Russians, the Soviets, because of the star. I didn't know Soviet stars were red. And there were black faces in the trucks. And I knew they were Americans, because I knew that there were 
what we call then Negroes in America and not in the Soviet Union. But they just kind of drove by. So nobody actually liberated us in the sense of coming in and, and throwing the Germans out and opening the doors. The Germans left, they fled, not saying a word to the prisoners. Didn't, they didn't say, you can go now. There just no, was nobody there. We wandered out in complete confusion. I saw people dying the day of liberation. And I heard comments, at least I'm free. Their condition was unbelievably bad. They were starved so bad that their legs looked like two broomsticks with a grapefruit stuck in between where the knee should be. And uh, they were so light that I can remember picking many of them up, two at a time, to carry them off the train. I was a big strapping young man at the time and had a lot of strength, but even so, uh, they only weighed 40 to 60 pounds a piece. They were just nothing but skin and bones. How did you manage to survive in the camp? Well, I was young and I was strong, and I almost didn't survive. I think the reason I survived is because my experience was relatively short. That is, in that particular camp, it was about five months. And I'm saying that because I lost more than half of my body weight, and I became ill with typhoid just after the camp uh, stopped being. So in spite of my uh, youth and physical strength, I probably wouldn't have lasted another month. Where will go now? Where? No home, because the Germans took the house apart. No home, no family, no country. Where will go? What will do? So the Red Cross took us in, and that's it. This was American soldier, and he said he's a Jew. What can we do for you? Tell us. We'll do anything. You want we should wash you. You want to do it. We didn't know what to do for him. Well, what did he? What did he do? What did, why did you want to do something for him? Because we saw he was a Jew. And he was an American soldier. And he was a Jew. We didn't know, we didn't know us, if we still have somebody left in this world. And they went to the city, and, and I came back with three handsome American soldiers. And they said that we are the first survivors they met and they embraced us and, and they were wonderful. They came back eventually and brought us food and clothing so we can change. And it was the most beautiful time of my life at that time. It was spring, it was May, May 8th. The weather was beautiful and the birds were singing and we were free and we don't have to starve and we don't have to march and we don't have to see all the horrors and we are alive and her life was in front of us. The system was put into place uh, to help take care of people uh, and a political problem develops. Where are they going to go? Are they going to go back to their homes in Poland? Were they welcome to go there? Uh, it's a very thorny problem. Uh, ultimately, a large number of them wanted to go to Israel, or what becomes Israel. But the British had a white paper in place. Mm -hmm. So uh, concentration camps empty and DP camps fill. And the same people are under much more humanitarian uh, conditions than the, than the concentration camps are nevertheless caught uh, in the vortex of history that nowhere to go. One soldier ask if we have relatives in America, if we want to immigrate to America. I picked up my hand and I said, I have, well, I spoke Yiddish. And he, it's a Jewish soldier. He spoke Yiddish. He understood Yiddish. And uh, I said, I have relatives in, in the United States. Bayard, New York, Bud Street, Elmira. 
I didn't know nothing. You know what? They found him. He was searching for them for a long time, and he found him. Maybe we get the, the, the license to go and see the meeting net. So to the doctors, you know, I was looking all of a sudden, finding on the list, Jacobson, to go. And he came in, 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 in the Elmire, oh my gosh. And I, when I was single, I would go with Nick D. Bick and, 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 and Jeremy, honest to God. I was so upset. No language, no job. My grandfather's side of the family, there were 12 kids, of which six or seven had immigrated to the U.S. way back, and they all settled in New York City. And then their offspring started moving other places. Like uh, one cousin of my mother moved to Unadilla. He was a, quite a cattle dealer, quite a businessman. And this, then another cousin followed to Bainbridge, and then my aunt and uncle followed and moved to Binghamton, and this is why we came to Binghamton. They needed a physician in the shoe factory. They had their own clinic, and the shoe factory was known, Etika Johnson, to employ lots of people from Europe. Polish, Slovak, Ukrainian, Czech. So I was at home. Was was alive. It was not a priest. Nobody. I don't know nothing what happened to my sisters. And then when he came here in Almiry, I had some people from other cities. They find now I'm alive, and they tell us the whole story of what happened to my sisters. And uh, then I find out everything what happened. If you want to get through your life, sometimes you have to bury the memory along with the people. And allow that, to allow that to come up is to, uh, to allow yourself to experience a great deal of personal pain. And, 30 years pass, 40 years pass, and you have different thoughts. If I don't tell my story, who will remember? I can never say uh, freely that I'm Jewish in between Gentiles, you know what I mean? I can never be like an American Jew, just, uh, you know, they just freely to say I'm Jewish. It's somehow I can't do that still. I'm always scared. I don't have enough confidence, you know, that took away my confidence. I do have nightmares and recurring nightmares, but uh, it's getting better. It's getting better. They're, they're definitely nightmares. Being trapped. Nightmares of being trapped and no way, no way out. For myself, and I'm pretty sure for many other people, we never completely survived the Holocaust the years, never. I don't think I was ever young. I had robbed of the childhood, the constant, constant feeling of being not wanted. And the Semitic persecution, camps, it was right along. I like to I like to teach people a little bit about that. Dr. Edmund Goldenberg died in August of 2004. His friend Rabbi Sussman was then in Germany leading an educational exchange with American and European youngsters. I believe the day of Dr. Goldenberg's uh, funeral, I was at Buchenwald with 11 Jewish kids and 12 German kids and um, we had a memorial service there, and I said Kaddish for Dr. Uh, Goldenberg there, uh, in the middle, right in the middle of a concentration camp, and, and I think he would have totally approved that it was a circle of, of, of understanding. 
Holocaust survivors who came to the southern tier of New York carried their experience with them and, if possible, behind them. They became U.S. citizens. They could go on and enjoy the blessings of everyday life, raise their families, and do their work. John Sternberg as an engineer, Kitty Fontaine Zilversmith, a pianist and composer, Ingrid Coveri would teach German at Cornell University, and Leopold Grunfeld became a professor in Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Jeanette and Jacob Geldwert managed a grocery store, and Jake would tell about his experience in the book From Auschwitz to Ithaca. In 1967, a pillared monument was erected on the grounds of Temple Israel in Vestal, in memory of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. For those who survived, there will always be the recognition that the event that changed them also changed the world. I have never forgot, forgotten the terrible, terrible time we went through. And I can still not go to the grocery store without thinking about poor people who cannot go to the grocery store and buy what they need. These are just basic, basic needs for any human being should, should have a right to do this. But um, I have come to the conclusion that happiness comes from within and not from luxury and things like that. My husband became president of the synagogue. He served for 11 years and I was president of the sisterhood. I was always serving on the board. I was working for United Jewish Appeal. I was so grateful to be here and I want to give of myself in return. When the Russian Jews came here much later and we were going to Florida, it was my, my privilege and my pleasure to help them. I cannot stand to say goodbye. I say so long to my friends. I never say goodbye. I can't. I'm an old man now. I still cannot do it. Support for We Don't Say Goodbye has been provided by the Robertson Museum and Science Center, Binghamton, the Sheldon H. Solo Foundation, the Shore Family, and the family of Dr. Edmund Goldenberg.